and um, God has called with anointing and strength to um, um, shepherd and oversee um, MCUSA, and he does it with great um, uh, anointing and strength and a deep commitment to the scriptures and a ministry that grows out of that uh, commitment um, to the scriptures and an anointing upon him. And so in the, in the, um, at the end of his message uh, yesterday morning, um, he invited uh, participants to um, come forward for uh, anointing, to be anointed with oil. I actually had four different um, anointing stations. And I think, I think every one of the uh, several hundred persons that were present went forward to one of those ministry stations. And, um, and then I'm you know, driving home afterwards and the sign uh, for the, uh, today's message is already on the, on the board. Our shepherd um, anoints with oil. And um, so as I was sitting there, having been so deeply moved again by his ministry, his message, uh, I was sitting there and when he invited persons to go forward for anointing, I knew that um, although there were four ministry stations, I wanted to go to the one where um, Irvin, who again is primarily God's shepherd of the broader Mennonite church, I wanted to go and receive anointing um, from um, Irvin and was um, blessed uh, to have that, um, have that opportunity. So we're looking uh, this morning then at this line, you anoint my head with oil. You anoint my head with oil. I would invite all who are able to stand for the reading of the word of the Lord. You'll find it um, as an insert in the bulletin. You respond with the dark print. The word of the Lord, Psalm 23. The Lord is shepherding me. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You bear a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup overflows together. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Brothers and sisters, the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We've um, been um, throughout this series um, referencing back to the life of David just as a way of being certain that the imagery that's here in the psalm, which is so familiar to us, being certain that we hear it out of a real life context, a real life kind of choosing of faith to believe in this good shepherd. And we know that David was a shepherd boy before he was called to be king, before he was anointed to be um, king of Israel. And as we recognized, um, particularly in the first message, a walkthrough of David's life, there were many, many things that he did well. He um, was deeply loved of God. He's an exemplary leader of God. He led God's people with wisdom and strength. But there were times in his life where he really made bad choices and messed up big time um, in ways that then, as sin always does, though he was forgiven of God and restored into his ongoing place of leadership, the impact of those choices of sin continued to, in other words, the seed that had been sown continued to bear fruit in such a way that David throughout his lifetime knew he needs a shepherd knew that God was protecting him, but that he needed God's protection, knew that um, 
um, God was leading him into green pastures and besides still waters, but knowing that he needed to be led into these places. So this imagery of anointing of the head with oil, I believe in a similar way, um, had that kind of real life shepherding experience applied into the real life of uh, David. So first of all, um, how did a shepherd use oil? Well, oil in that uh, cultural context had a medicinal value. Shepherds would apply it when the sheep had experienced um, some kind of uh, wounding, particularly a wound that would open the skin and therefore make the sheep vulnerable for infection or for flies that would uh, fester and, and create infection. And so the shepherd um, carried with him a, um, a vial of oil or some container of oil. And when the shepherd discovered um, throughout the day or particularly as he stood guard as the sheep entered into the sheep fold where he would get to see each of the sheep when the shepherd discovered a, a wound that would make the um, sheep vulnerable, he would uh, apply um, oil as a protective um, anointing, a protective um, application. Now, we know that um, oil does not in and of itself heal. And um, not, the, not the physical component, nor when we um, um, extend invitation for an anointing with oil. Oil in and, itself, in and of, of, of itself does not heal. What the oil did was created a cover or a context or a safety. Um, for the natural healing that God has built into the body, um, in, in that context, the body of the sheep um, applied to us as well, that natural capacity to heal when the invading forces are, are um, covered over. So it's more of a um, creating the space for um, healing to happen. And it's not a guarantee. Um, there were times where the shepherd would apply oil and um, um, the wound would be so great or you know, some other factor, the sheep would be lost. Um, it's true of ourselves as well. James 5 is the um, a biblical example where um, when we offer anointing, for instance, after um, each service, uh, we have a um, member of the pastoral team here at the front available for prayer. Um, we also have here in the, um, in the, in the basket a little vial of uh, oil that if you wish to be anointed, you can, you can simply say, I, I, I'd like this morning to be anointed. And if you can name what it is that you're, being, that you're requesting anointing for, you know, that's, that's wonderful too. But if you choose not to, that's okay. But um, the oil does not have any healing power. Jesus is the healer, okay? But because God's word instructs, if you're sick, call together the elders of the church and have them anoint you with oil. We do it in obedience to the scripture. We do it in obedience to the word. And it's simply a way of posturing oneself, yielding oneself, putting oneself into that place where if God in God's sovereignty wants to do something dramatic and supernatural, God can because you've, you've stepped into that spot. You've opened yourself to it. Um, there are multiple examples of people whose healing ended up being different than what they would have wished for. Um, you've heard my wife testify of when she was pregnant with our first child and got Bell's palsy, a paralysis that affects the nerves on the one side of her face. The muscles wouldn't move anymore because the nerve that affects the face had become severely damaged. 
and um, we asked for anointing with oil. It didn't heal her face. Um, she still lives with some of the consequences of that, um, of that illness, of that sickness. But she testifies to the reality that God healed a deep kind of um, Oh, fear is not the right word, but she had, been, she had been raised in a family where physical perfection was incredibly important, particularly for women. And so there needed to be a healing, giving her courage to live with strength when the body was no longer fully functional. And I loved her immensely before. But I love her even more deeply as I've watched her with strength live through and way beyond being in front of masses of people in times, not worrying about the way the tongue needs to now more consciously form words, not worrying about the partial paralysis yet on that side of the face, but speaking and glowing and radiating in confidence so that the Holy Spirit brought about a healing deep in the soul, giving courage and strength. And there would be multitudes of other kinds of stories where God's healing was not in the way that we would wish. I have no doubt, really no doubt, that um, when... Um, Gloria and Gloria's family are reunited with uh, Dan and Glory. Um, hopefully for them, not for decades yet, but I have no doubt that when they're reconnected with Dan, Dan is going to say, you know what, in the great span of eternity, <laughs> it was okay. that um, my life was cut short by the way we define life. And when that electric shock went through him, that um, it took his life. The ultimate healing is that uh, restoration onto the other side of glory where we're given a new body that's free from pain. We're given a new body that's not susceptible to death ever again. We're given a new body that um, is free from sin. We're given an eternal um, connection to our Creator and to our Lord that cannot be disrupted. That, in the end, is the ultimate, final, most beautiful act of healing that God does. So anointing with oil on this side of glory puts us in a place and a posture where we open ourselves to God healing in whatever way God desires and defines in God's great wisdom. In the um, Anabaptist renewal uh, meetings uh, this week, yesterday morning, after having heard uh, many powerful messages and sat in on numerous excellent uh, workshops and having experienced significant worship, I was ready to go home. Thought I would be ready to go home by the middle of the morning. I thought I would slip out right after Irvin's message. And uh, instead, I just felt drawn. I, 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 I didn't want to miss anything. And so I stayed. And I was so glad I had for numerous reasons. Um, but one of them was uh, James Crable, um, who was a member of the listening committee, um, there specifically to listen to what was being said and what the Spirit of God was saying. Um, James was invited um, not only to give the listening committee's report, but right at the end, prior to the benediction, was invited by um, um, Sunoco, um, the powerful Asian pastor who oversaw the um, time, I was invited by Sunoco to give an overview from his missiological 
perspective. In other words, he's been a mission worker all of his life. Um, I, I was in um, seminary with James, and soon after he graduated, he and his wife went to Africa. Uh, they've been involved in overseeing the renewal movements that God has done. He's been one of the instruments that uh, has overseen that on behalf of Mennonite Mission Net Network, now works um, for Mennonite Mission Network. And so Sonoko just invited James to say, what have you seen God doing here? What have you seen about renewal that helps renewal be sustained? And James said, when renewal is sustained long term, it pays attention to four biblical themes and it doesn't compromise any of the four. He said it always pays attention to the truth of Colossians 1, 5 to 20, that the, the work of God has cosmic proportions. God is reconciling all things. And he said, just in case there's people here who don't know the Greek, the root of the Greek word in the New Testament means all things. In other words, it's cosmic. It's all peoples, all nationalities, all races, all, all peoples. But it's even beyond that. It's the healing of the earth. It's the healing of all things. It's, it's restoring dysfunctional um, principalities and powers. It, it's obliterating evil out of those systems. All things, Colossians 1. But he said it's not so big as to be beyond us. In other words, renewal that sustains recognizes that the work of Jesus comes all the way into the personal. Romans 5. We have been reconciled. Renewal moments that only emphasize the personal become pious and eventually irrelevant to God's purposes. Renewal moments that only emphasize the cosmic become eventually legalistic. A liberal legalism. Well, you need both to be sustainable, to be big enough to be gospel. The third one is we become witnesses of Jesus. We use our mouth to speak up on behalf of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, we're God's ambassadors. God's making his appeal through us. And then the fourth was we become workers for Jesus. So the gospel transforms the work of our hands and the work of our energy and our 24-7 lives, Ephesians 2, the making of two people who are at enmity with each other into a one body. Back to becoming witnesses of Jesus, the beautiful, powerful story that was told by Irvin Stutzman um, at the uh, 7 o'clock breakfast for um, leaders up at Yoder's, uh, several hundred people that gathered there. And Irvin began by thanking the um, um, Anabaptist renewal leaders for praying for him when Irvin had met with them to talk about, because they wanted his counsel, they didn't want this to be seen as a threat to MCUSA, but to be genuinely seen as an attempt to bring renewal. So they invited uh, Irvin to be present. And Irvin in that setting asked them to pray for him because that night he was meeting with a man who was coming to Harrisonburg um, and it was, was is a Chinese um, professor, a professor of philosophy in China, actually teaches in a huge university, so has significant influence. This man was going to be having dinner that night at Irvin and Bonnie's home. And Irvin said, pray for me, pray for us, that we might give a faithful witness. It was Irvin's, that day was Irvin's 60th birthday. It was he and Bonnie's anniversary, but what he was after was being a faithful witness. And um, at the um, breakfast the uh, other morning, he said, thank you for your prayers, because he said that teacher in a Chinese university who teaches Marxist philosophy made a commitment to Jesus that night in our home. And Irvin began to weep. He said he's become a believer. And uh, Irvin paired um, this professor from China with John R. Martin. Um, John R. and his wife were also there that evening. John R., that perked up my ears because anytime you ask Cindy who her pastor was or is, she references John R. Martin. When Cindy was in the formative teen years, John R was the pastor at Nestville where Cindy grew up and then he left Nestville to become registrar at EMS and um, 
So Irvin um, connected John R. with this professor um, from China, and, this, and John R. is mentoring him. So this professor is now returning again um, to visit, and so um, uh, Irvin asked us again to be um, in prayer. He said that um, in China, when a person becomes a Christian, they take on a Christian name. And so this man had asked Irvin, would Irvin give him, a, give him a biblical name? And so Irvin made it a matter of prayer, and the next day gave a number of options, and the man chose Joseph as his biblical name. So if you pray for this man, pray for Joseph. But here's the part that additionally impacted me deeply. A professor in a um, university in China, and since coming to faith, I think four or five months ago, he has already read through the scriptures start to finish two times and is well on the way through the third reading of the scriptures. He spends two to three hours a day immersed in the scriptures and Irvin said the man's life has been transformed by witnessing for Jesus. I did a little dance in my office about a month and a half ago when I heard that um, a member of our congregation spoke up and witnessed to um, an individual who had begun worshiping with us and she made a commitment to Jesus. So renewal that is sustainable is cosmic in proportion, personal in application, witnessing through the mouth and working with the hands to make the world a better place. Irvin yesterday morning told another story of the largest Mennonite affiliated church in the world. It's in Indonesia, a country with huge tensions between Christians and Muslims. If there'd be any place that would um, be justified in believing, as Irvin reminded us, too many Christians in America believe that the only right place for a Muslim is in the sights of a rifle and in the bullseye of a drone. If there's any place that would, could believe that way, could justify believing that way, it would be Indonesia. But this church has a passion to reach their Muslim neighbors for Jesus. And the church has grown to be 20,000 strong. And every one of the 20,000 is in a small group being mentored and discipled. They built a stadium that they call the Holy Stadium. And um, Irvin told us that the next World Conference, well, the next one is this summer year from now in Harrisburg, but the one after that will be in this Holy Stadium uh, in uh, Indonesia. So a context of immense tensions a people deeply committed at great sacrifice to touching their Muslim neighbors. And Irvin reminded us that in the Quran, Jesus is honored. He's just not recognized as Savior and Lord, but he's honored. He's actually honored as a healing prophet. And so Irvin told the story of an evening when Irvin was there present in this gathering, in this, um, in this uh, stadium, or in, 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 in a gathering, and the local imam of the village. And he said, uh, Sunoko tells him, it's the Amman who is the most fundamentalist and the most conservative in his Muslim belief. He wears the head thing and, you know, the dress, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. His nine-year-old daughter was going blind. And the Amman knew that this is the worshiping people who worship Jesus. And the Amman knew that in the Quran, Jesus is named as the healing prophet. And he brought his nine-year-old daughter and led her forward. And he said, I guarantee you the people prayed with incredible fervency. And in that setting, in that day, God chose to heal. Now again, we don't understand why God doesn't all the time. But praise God, in that setting, in that day, God healed this Muslim Iman's nine-year-old daughter. And the Iman 
has been since praising Jesus as the Lord who can heal. Now, why did I tell that story in the point of becoming workers for Jesus? Well, here's two reasons. Two ways that they are expressing the love of Jesus in addition to witnessing. They've turned that holy stadium during the week into a marketplace because they discovered that many of the Muslim farmers can barely eke out a subsistence raising rice because the rice that they were selling, they'd get pennies on the dollar selling it to a middleman. They'd get several cents of what that rice would be worth. If, say, the rice would be worth a dollar, they'd get several cents selling it to the middleman, and the middleman would get all the profits. And these subsistence farmers eking out a living could barely support their families. And so they began, they opened up their holy stadium as a marketplace, and these Muslim farmers bring their rice, and they get a dollar on a dollar. Reminded me of the work of MEDA, Mennonite Economic Development Associates, Mennonite business people who have been transforming the world through those kind of means. If you don't know anything about MEDA and you're a Mennonite business person, you ought to, you ought to know about MEDA. They're transforming um, cultures through similar kind of means in the name of Jesus. The other thing this um, largest Mennonite affiliated church in Indonesia has done, they've started a school. The overwhelming majority of the students are Muslim. The parents sign a permission that in that school, Jesus will be testified to. 400 students. And I thought of uh, the Hebron School that Ada and Ida from our congregation began how many decades ago in Hebron, Israel, a highly politicized uh, Muslim town. It is unapologetically yet today a school that is known to be Christian testifies of the love of Jesus and is defended by the power forces, the Muslim power people in that town because they know that there's integrity to the hands of the work and the transforming of the minds of the students such that they're open to the witness of Jesus. Anointing with oil opens us up, puts us in a place of renewal so that God can empower and authorize. It's just a simple gesture. Nothing magical in the oil. The power, the strength, the anointing is in putting oneself in trust anew into the hands of a loving shepherd. Redeeming Jesus. So, I'm grateful we offer prayer and anointing. I think today it's Rod and Heidi who represent the pastoral team. You don't have to have any great significant needs other than wanting to put yourself in a place where if God wants to do something new, you're giving God permission. He anoints my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, surely, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I I will dwell 
in the house of the Lord forever. Healed. Restored. Amen. Amen.